Good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing well, and uh, I hope uh, you're, you're getting ready for this rollout of this new disclosure. And um, obviously, it says a lot just getting into it that uh, you're signing up for a webinar like this, and, and hopefully you'll find the time that we spend valuable. But I do want to encourage you to take, care, uh, take advantage of asking Amy questions. She's sitting right next to me. And, um, if there's anything that's critical that you're thinking you need to know as far as information, I'm sure there are others out there thinking the same thing. So uh, with that, I'll kind of get started. And, you know, like Roxy said, I'm a producing uh, loan originator, and so I'm, I'm in the trenches with you guys every day and uh, understand those, those client concerns and uh, the pressure that goes along with each transaction and closing on time and those dominoes that fall and so uh, I just want you all to know that I'm I'm very empathetic of that uh, pressure that you uh, you feel day to day but just to walk through some quick goals for this because as you know we're all a, uh, it's a goal-oriented goal business and uh, but I just want to lay out these quick goals to make sure that, that we're starting from uh, the right mindset going into the presentation so I'm going to lay out the quick background for where this uh, legislation and, and these rules came from, um, but then more specifically, I want to get into the practical application of what this means for transactions moving forward as of August 1st of this year. Um, and then from there, uh, I really think anytime something like this happens and there's a, a big change within our industry, it creates a lot of opportunity. And so I want to make sure that that opportunity is not missed. And, and again, by y'all getting out in front of this, it, it's incredibly important uh, to be able to take advantage of that and, and to use something like this to your advantage to gain market share. But uh, hopefully that's not, those aren't too lofty of goals, but uh, with that, we'll get into it. So just the history of loan estimates. Uh, as Rocky said, I got into the business in 02 and started producing in 04 and 05. And, and at that time, um, there were about three times as many originators as there are today. Okay, and So anytime you have that sort of saturation, um, you have some bad apples that can be out there. And obviously, the more there are, um, a, a larger group of bad apples can potentially cause problems. And, and it was always strange to me that uh, we would provide an estimate up front for clients and then uh, at closing they basically just had to hope that the numbers looked exactly like you said it was, uh, said they would be. And you know I was fortunate to be at a company that uh, no matter what we said <clears throat> to the client up front, that's what we delivered at the end. But uh, unfortunately not everyone out there operated that way and so um, Again, prior to 2010, there was really no consistent form of disclosure from company to company. So, so you would get Excel spreadsheets if you were a client. You would get a PDF with a, a certain format. But a client could be looking at four or five different documents from four or five different lenders and really not have a clue what they're looking at. And so, so this standardization needed to occur. And, and of course, after the meltdown in 08 and 09, uh, we really felt like as an industry we've got to have some, some clarity here on how we can make this crystal clear for the clients and, and just have them be comfortable with what they're getting. So, um, so if you go back to uh, the original client disclosure, it comes from the Truth in Lending Act of 1968. So the APR, the, the fun document that everybody loves at closing and uh, some people refer to it as this is not your rate document. Um, because it gives you a percentage that's slightly higher than your interest rate, but um, uh, it was built as a tool to help borrowers compare lender to lender. And so I think that's important to keep in mind as we move into this new disclosure is that the government's always felt like the more options clients have, the better that they'll be at the end of the day. Um, and so, so again, prior to 2010, a fees worksheet is really uh, the best thing that could be provided for a client. And, and it was the only document that clearly laid out processing, underwriting, all the fees that might go with a transaction. And of course it had interest rate, loan amount, all of those things on there. Um, but, but again, it, it varied very much from, from uh, lender to lender and you could 
a lender might omit certain things like a title policy or uh, inspection fee or survey, and there was really no accountability for that. And so, um, so in looking at this truth in lending, I think everybody needs to understand that that when uh, this rolls out on August 1st, the truth in lending is still, even though it's gone, okay, so even though good faith estimate and truth in lending are terms that will not exist in the business anymore, which is a little crazy to think about, um, but some of the tools that are available within the truth in lending have transferred over to the new closing disclosure, okay? And a lot of that was done uh, not because they're such good tools to use, but because they're so embedded into the, uh, the laws that, that govern what we do day to day, the CFPB just couldn't eliminate them. So without revising acts and bills and going through Congress and doing all these things, they had to utilize some of the tools that are available on the truth and lending. Okay? So again, we'll go through those in more detail, but I just wanna make sure that's clear. So uh, to get the critical dates out of the way, and, and some of the terms that you're going to see. Uh, as of August 1st, okay, so applications as of August 1st, so don't feel like every closing you have in 2015 has to close on July 31st, all right? That is not the case. As long as the borrower has a property under contract and they've made application as of August 1st, that will allow them to close under the current disclosures, all right? Just, again, um, I know everybody's probably canceled their July and August vacations to prepare for this, but uh, in reality, it, it's, it's going to be as of that date. So there will be a lot of applications, I'm sure, taken that last week in July to prepare for it. But um, there have been rumors out there, and I've even seen stuff as recently as this week, that, oh, surely Congress will go ahead and delay this, and, and uh, this won't roll out August 1st. If I were in Vegas, I would bet a lot of money that that's not the case and that this absolutely will be rolled out on August 1st, okay? We have had over 20 months now to be able to prepare for this and, and really closer to 21 and 22 as we get even closer. But, um, you know, this rolled out in November of 2013 where this initiative was going to take place. And they, they've given us the forms for that long. So anyone in the public domain could go to the CFPB website and, and view these documents and be able to walk through them and see what they're going to be looking at. So, so now that we've wiped GFE and TIL from our, our uh, real estate vocabulary, let's go ahead and look at the new terms that you're going to see. All right, you have a new loan estimate. And this new loan estimate is going to mirror the closing disclosure. The loan estimate is a three-page version of the five-page version that will be done at closing. But part of what the CFPB did is, is they went out and went to several different markets and they said, we need a, an initial disclosure that we can compare to the final closing disclosure. And, and they were tired of it, uh, fees worksheets and GFEs not looking exactly like the HUD looked. And, and so now we have this new closing disclosure that will look exactly like the loan estimate. The client can bring it to closing. They can match up line for line to make sure exactly uh, that, that what they're getting at the end of the day is exactly what they expected from the beginning. And then a big term that you're going to see a lot of focus on is TIP, or total interest percentage. And this is the total interest that's assigned to a transaction. So if it's a 30-year fix, it's the total amount of interest that a borrower would pay over a 30-year period. And, and then it takes that interest divided into the loan amount, and that, that percentage that's created is what goes on this disclosure. And I think a lot of banks have been fighting uh, this with the CFPB, but the CFPB feels that this is an important metric. And, and I kind of agree with them. I think it's nice to know what something is costing you, uh, not just on a monthly basis, but saying, all right, over the life of a loan, how much does this really cost me? And, and again, being able to compare that from transaction to transaction is, is really critical. So, so let's talk about the CFPB for a minute, because I think the CFPB uh, tends to immediately get labeled as just another government entity that is now encroaching on what we do, okay? 
And so whether you're big government or small government, uh, it really doesn't matter uh, because the CFPB has one goal in mind, and that is to protect the consumer. Okay? They have uh, no ties to any political organization or uh, left leanings, right leanings. They are not tied to anyone. They're not funded. They are 100% funded by themselves. Okay? So if they see action that needs to be taken out there to punish a lender, um, they will go ahead and, and, and go after them. They will take a fine. They will take another set of money, and they will distribute to the customers that were, that were harmed by that company. So, so again, the CFPB is getting a really bad rap out there, but at the end of the day, this is something that was built to protect the consumer, and they felt like this was a critical area that they needed to address. And, and just to get into uh, the dynamics of the CFPB inner workings, uh, they are hiring the, some of the best and brightest out there. Okay? They are recruiting people that might normally go to Wall Street and giving them positions uh, within the CFPB to be able to go out there and, and compete with these private organizations. And so I think private industry has always had this reputation that they can outsmart the government. Well, the CFPB said, we'll fix that and we'll go ahead and, and we'll hire um, some, of those, some of those competitive uh, young people that are coming out of schools or the people who've been in the business for a long time who know the inner workings of this business. So, uh, again, and then, you know, getting into minimal oversight and accountability, I think this is something that we will see change in the coming years. I think the CFPB will ultimately have a little more accountability to Congress and, and as far as reporting and budget and finance committees, I think they will be be reined in a little bit, but at this point, again, they operate solely on their own and everything uh, they do from budgets to action uh, it just falls under their roof and they can continue to do that. So again, taking that mindset of the consumer being protected is really key moving forward. So just in the short time that the CFPB has been created, and this goes back to when Dodd-Frank was passed, all right? When Dodd-Frank was passed, that's when the CFPB was created. And, and on January 10th of last year is when uh, the ability to repay and QM, uh, meaning qualified mortgages, that all went into play. And so, so you may have seen some changes at the beginning of last year, and, and those changes affected underwriting and how smoothly uh, loans went through the system. But this ability to repay is really key. And, and obviously this attacks one thing, and that's stated income, because uh, the CFPB, is, as early as they were created, uh, put a story out on their website about a janitor in California uh, that was being given a six or $700,000 house. And, and that wasn't right, and that wasn't fair, because he was told to state his income on his application. And so I, I don't take a one-sided look at this and say, wow, what an unscrupulous um, lender or real estate agent that advised this borrower to do that. Um, I, I have to put some responsibility on the borrower as well, but, uh, but you can see where the CFPB feels like the little guy was harmed in a lot of those situations. And so they said, okay, we're just going to have a set of guidelines that no matter what, if somebody is getting a mortgage, they have to qualify under these parameters, meaning two years of tax returns and stability of employment. And, and so rather than just saying, uh, we'll take what Fannie Mae says or we'll take what FHA or VA says, they said, you know what, we want to we want to go across the board and say any mortgage lending that's being done needs to meet these guidelines. Okay, And, and again, in, in looking at the CFPB almost more as a private entity out there, uh, they've done a good job in, in researching, and they went uh, to over 20 cities, and, um, and they spent time with over 80 borrowers in each of those 20 cities to be able to look at uh, these disclosures and, and go ahead and get some clarification from those borrowers as to what they think uh, is really important and what they see. Now, just to kind of get into some quotes from the CFPB website, because I think it's important to know what their mindset is, uh, they feel like the consumer having greater control over the mortgage loan process is a byproduct of this change. Okay, So they went through two years of research, 
uh, case studies, focus groups, you know, all of those buzzwords out there, but they really, they really cared about doing this the right way. Um, but another quote was being able to disclose information in a way that consumers can understand. Okay? And then the last one, which again, you have to remember, they're still somewhat tied to the government and, and somewhat a government entity, um, but they were so proud of themselves because they saw a 29% improvement in, in this document being able to better answer questions about uh, a sample loan. And so, uh, to me, a 29% improvement is not a huge number, uh, especially when the, the general information out there tends to have a very low approval rating as far as borrowers being to understand what they see as far as loan documents. A 29% improvement isn't a big thing, but they were all high-fiving each other over it. And, and so, we'll take that for what it's worth. All right, going back to, to clients shopping for their loans and, and understanding what's best. The CFPB says, all right, if a client can shop for their loan, uh, then immediately they can find the best loan available for them. And while that might be the case, obviously they've completely left out the process and the knowledge of the loan originator, the knowledge of the team involved to be able to get a transaction from day one to day 30 to close on time, okay? And so, so you have to take it with a grain of salt when the CFPB says, well, we just assume that the cheapest option is the best option, all right? And I know we've got a lot of brokers out there uh, listening to this and realtors on this, and, and you would probably have a pretty strong argument for the level of service that's created uh, in selling a, a house for somebody who offers maybe a flat fee of $500 to sell a house versus a percentage of real estate commission, okay? Uh, you'd like to think that, that sometimes there's a, a fine balance in the amount you pay and the service that you're given, all right? And the knowledge of that professional and, and how they can advise you and help you. And, and I've always kind of had this mindset of, well, if the value that's being created, no matter who it is, all right, if you're buying a car, if you're uh, selling a house, getting a loan, hopefully the, the value that's being created by the person that you're using far exceeds the compensation that they're being paid, all right? And I think realtors uh, are the biggest example of this. A great realtor um, is worth far more than 3%, uh, assuming they're just uh, representing one side of the transaction and you know whether that's a seller and, and protecting legally and all those different things. So again, I, I just want to I want to caution us when we take this mindset of comparing these disclosures from lender to lender and saying, well, the cheapest one is automatically the best one because that's not always the case. Again, there's a fine balance there. Um, so all right, so let's get into the, the good faith estimate that was created in 2010. All right, this was a RESPA initiative that was taken, taken on by them, and this was really the first uh, formalized version of a document that gets used between every single lender on every single transaction in America. All right, And so this document, of course, is the one we use today, and it's been in use for over five years now, which is a little crazy to think about, but, uh, but they really got a lot of things right when they did this good faith estimate. And, uh, and so we'll talk about these sections that are then going to carry over to the new closing disclosure. And, and one of the most important sections that I feel like was available is this important question section. They felt like there are five important questions that a consumer needed to know, and, and these questions are not only on the good faith estimate, but they're on the, the current HUD that we use right now. So can your interest rate rise? Obviously, is it an arm? You know, is it a 30-year fix? Or can the rate adjust seven years, five years, 10 years from now? All right. If you make your payments on time, can your loan balance rise? Yes or no? Basically, is it a negative amortization loan? Uh, if you make your payments on time, can your monthly amount for principal interest in any mortgage insurance rise? Yes or no? Prepayment penalties and balloons. Okay. So these are considered risky features by the government entities, and so they feel like it's important for the client to know these, and I 100% agree. This is a great way for someone to be able to compare lender to lender and say, all right, I know they're giving me a rate that seems lower than everybody else. 
is there something behind there? Is this an arm that I'm going to potentially have to deal with a different rate at a, at a different point in time? But then one of the problems that we have with this disclosure is one, it doesn't show the borrower's all-in monthly payment, and two, it doesn't show them what they bring to closing, okay? And those are really two of the critical things when somebody's buying a house, how much is it gonna cost me out of pocket, and how much am I gonna be paying monthly? And so to leave those two things out uh, is really kind of a big deal and, and a mistake, I think, on their part, which is why we have this new disclosure coming out. They're really correcting and righting some of the wrongs that they missed back in 2010. Um, and then most importantly, in my opinion, was there's no place to sign. So as lenders, we had to create a separate document that said uh, that the borrower actually received this. And, and so now the new, the new loan estimate that's received up front will have a signature place on it. And then of course the closing disclosure that replaces the HUD uh, will have one as well. But, so getting into this new form and, and, and getting into those specific changes, like I talked about the monthly payment, the cash to close, um, there's a specific section for seller paid or lender paid fees on the current disclosure, that doesn't exist. So in Texas, where we have larger title policies, it, it shows on a good faith estimate as though the borrower is going to have to come out of pocket for this. And, and obviously when I say borrower, I'm meaning buyer, so um, hopefully that's translating well enough. But, uh, but to get into uh, that good faith estimate and say this $3,000 title policy, I know I'm showing that you're paying it, but really the seller's paying it for you, uh, it takes a level of trust from the client and, and it's a little bit confusing. And in other states where title policies aren't as big, uh, obviously it's not as big a deal. But uh, in Texas, that's always been a big deal to me that, that we have this number that the client thinks they're uh, not paying, but yet it shows on all these disclosures that they are. Uh, so again, showing earnest money I think is important to show on this document. Uh, clearly breaking down potential payment adjustments. So, so it actually goes out further if somebody were to, to pick an arm because they say, well, I'm only gonna be in this house five years, so I'd love a seven-year arm to get past that five-year period and go ahead and save me some monthly payment and save me some interest. Well, it shows them very clearly what their payment would look like seven, eight, nine, ten years down the road once those adjustments start to happen. And, and right now that doesn't exist we talked about the total interest paid number. Um, and then I think this is a good one. I think it, it'll be a little bit shocking to people, but there's a five-year accumulation of the principal and interest paid, closing costs, and mortgage insurance. And, and that's really a great number that somebody can use to compare from lender to lender because there are all sorts of tools and and opportunities that people use to buy out mortgage insurance and potentially increase their rate. But this gives them a great way to be able to compare option to option and say, all right, what are we dealing with here? How much does this loan really cost me? Because somebody's telling me that it saves me money, but how do I really know that for sure? This is the way to know for sure. And I think the five-year cost really gives somebody a good comprehensive breakdown of, of what that looks like. Okay, so let's get into these forms a little bit. Uh, these are the forms that I pulled directly from the CFPB website, and I've got um, that website link at the end, and so as soon as we're done with the presentation, I'll go ahead and leave that up for you, that way you can see it. Uh, but let's go through these, and I'm not gonna go through them line by line, because you'll be able to look at them, and of course they'll be up um, available once the webinar's done. Uh, but let's go through at least these important questions up on the right side, top right, where we've got the loan term, uh, the purpose of the transaction, the product. I don't know why they chose a five-year interest only to use as their example since that product really doesn't exist out there in the market. There are some limited applications for it and, and limited sources for it, but I think it's a little interesting that they chose a very aggressive product that they essentially outlawed. Um, but again, that's what we deal with. Uh, conventional FHA, VA, of course, is important. And, and then is the rate locked? Because these estimates can be sent out and, and buyers can say, well, I was offered this rate, but is it actually locked? And that's an important critical thing, especially when 
uh, you're dealing with volatile interest rate markets, kind of like we are today. We've seen rates swing up and back and down uh, a quarter of a point from day to day and sometimes even within the day the last couple weeks because there's been so much activity in the equity and bond markets. Uh, and then getting here's where you see those important five questions that I talked about from the good faith estimate and how they translate over. Uh, so you can see the prepayment penalty, um, can your monthly interest rate change, and, and can any of those things move. So, uh, so I'll go, again, you can go through those yourself, but I think it, it, it's really clear as to how it looks. Let's see, we've got a question here. Will, will the new rules limit a max days to lock? As far as, uh, yeah, right now there's really not a maximum number of days that you can lock in and there won't be moving forward. So, so in general, uh, Chase and Wells and, and the, the banks that we sell to, most of them do only allow 90 days for a free lock, all right? But for an extended lock, you can pay an upfront fee and, and that, will, that will still be available within this. It just means that this loan estimate needs to be given as soon as that extended lock is in place. So if somebody was building a house, let's say, and they wanted to protect their interest rate, they could do a nine month lock, but they're gonna have to pay a fee up front to be able to secure that nine month lock. So hopefully that answers the question there. All right, moving into the second, uh, or the bottom section of the loan estimate, uh, let's go through these boxes here. You've got years one to five, okay? So this, again, would be a five-year arm, and it's saying that there's only interest that's going to be paid that first five years. And then years six through eight, because this loan is going to adjust every three years after that five-year time period. Uh, so you can see the mortgage insurance, and, and this person isn't escrowing, uh, so, so there's no escrow being shown here. Uh, but it'll show the minimum and maximum payment after the adjustments. And so those are important numbers. That's what everybody needs to know. What's my worst case scenario? What's my best case scenario? And so if it's not a fixed rate loan, those are, those are numbers that people have to have in the back of their mind because they have to plan accordingly. And, and again, you can see where the mortgage insurance drops off in year 11, and then years 12 through 30, you can see that that minimum and maximum payment that exists. Uh, now it clearly defines whether somebody's escrowing or not. Um, and then from there it gets into the actual estimated closing cost. And then again, that very important number of the estimated cash to close. So, so there's a clearer breakdown later on in the document. And, and with five pages, I would hope that they have now accomplished what we used to be able to accomplish in one page. but. Uh, getting into timing. So, so timing is what's so important uh, about this. And, and one of the big, I think, uh, issues that, that realtors and NAR has tried to take up with, uh, with Congress in, in getting the seven-day provision. So there's a seven-day provision. If somebody were to start, start a loan application today, they are not allowed to close until that seven-day period has expired. And so if there's a cash offer that's closing in four or five days, there's no way someone who's getting financing can compete with that. And so that's gonna still be in place. And, and as you all know, that it'd be incredibly tough to put a transaction together in eight days with uh, appraisal and title and all of these things anyway. So I, I've never thought that that seven day issue's a big deal. Um, but when I spent some time in DC last year, it was a big issue in California that uh, they were having to compete with so many cash offers from foreign buyers that they, they were trying to get that seven day provision re repealed and it's just not going to happen. They, uh, it's kind of the cooling off period that the government feels is important between when a transaction starts to when it finishes. That way somebody doesn't feel like they're rushed into something. Uh, but obviously here's the big one that everybody's talking about and everybody uh, knows is really critical and everything's going to focus around the three business days that are uh, where the closing disclosure has to be received prior to consummation. Okay, And so we get into the question of is the first day day zero or day one like, a, like a, an option period might be and, and I, I was given some information from Pearson and Patterson who we work with closely on getting this rolled out correctly and they said, don't think of it as days, think of it as nights. 
Okay, so if you're thinking of three business days, it's really three business nights, meaning Monday night. So if a, if a loan disclosure is given on Monday, uh, you have Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, close on Thursday. All right, one important thing is federal holidays will be factored into this. And then of course, if, if someone is, uh, if a lender is closed on Saturday and Sunday, as most are, that could be a problem because you have to factor all of those days into when this closing disclosure must be received. Um, and, and changes harmful to the consumer in this document will trigger an additional three-day waiting period. And so let's go through those because I think, I think there's a mindset out there when everybody hears this and we, you know, we, tend, to go to the, we tend to assume change is negative rather than positive. Um, but I'm going to show you all how this closing disclosure might actually speed up um, some current closings that get delayed and that we've seen for, from other companies out there that have delayed our, uh, our buyer who might be selling their house and, and some of the changes that went into effect there. So um, the CFPB uh, hasn't really put out any calendars because they tend to have to operate on a 50-state basis. Um, but Pearson and Patterson, which the website is ppdocs.com, uh, has, has put some calendars out there that you can go look at and you can actually say if we start an application on this date and my client exec executes a contract on this date, when can we close? All right. And so within the month of September 2015, so this is obviously very applicable, it shows some sample scenarios and how this looks. And it, I, think it's, I think it's good because it wraps in Labor Day and, and shows the importance there. But, but let's assume that a, a contract is executed on Friday. All right, at that point, the buyer reaches out to their lender and says, all right, I would like to lock my rate in. Here's my property address. We're moving forward with this thing, and we're going to close uh, by the end of the month. I say, great, the rate's locked at that point. And so now let's keep in, keep in mind um, when this needs to be disclosed. All right, so, so the fourth is night one. And then um, if the lender is open on Saturday, we would have to count the fifth as night two. And then the eighth would be night three. And then that disclosure has to be given on Wednesday. If the lender's closed on Saturday, then of course they would have until Thursday because that would technically be uh, the third business day after the rate was locked. So that's not something you all have to worry about, but obviously it's very critical from a lending perspective, making sure that that, that information is given in a timely manner. All right, we've got another question. Does the amount on the cash to close have to be within a certain percentage of the actual cash? No, that's a great question, and the answer is no. All right, so we'll get into um, to, to what does affect a redisclosure and what triggers that, but, but no, the cash to close does not uh, need to be within a certain percentage because the, the metrics that the CFPB is using are really focused more around that total interest percentage and then the product that the borrower is getting. So, so they will allow for down payment changes because people will say at the last minute, hey, I'd like to put a little more down to lower my payment. Uh, that is not something that would re require a redisclosure, but yeah, great question. All right, so getting back into this document, we want to look at when, if we're closing on the 24th of that September, on Monday of that week is when the closing disclosure must be given to the client. Okay, And I like that they gave an example here that the walkthrough shows a broken dishwasher and now a seller credit is provided. I think the general mindset out there is that if there's a seller credit provided, it changes the closing disclosure and therefore redisclosure must take place. That is not the case at all. Okay? The borrower always has a 24 hour right to delay their closing if there is a change to that document though. But of course if that's in the buyer's favor and most anything at the last minute is typically going to be in the buyer's favor, I doubt they're going to enact their 24-hour waiting period and, and close a little bit later. So again, I know everybody's been uh, sitting in uh, different meetings around town and they're saying the 30-day closing is non-existent and it won't happen anymore, uh, but you can see right here, this is a 20-day closing 
from September 4th to September 24th, and, and it gives plenty of time for underwriting, appraisal, all of those things. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing a lot of realtors out there uh, advise their clients on right now is that the appraisal needs to be ordered as soon as the contract is executed. And so I would, I would share that advice with you all and, and say, you know what, the appraisal is probably going to become similar to a sunk cost like an inspection report right now. And, and while that inspection report, if things don't turn out well, they can just walk away. And if you can get a 10 day option period and get that appraisal done within that 10 days, I think, I think it's something that could help you and your client because it just gives you more leverage. So uh, again, I wanted to pass along that advice. You may strongly disagree with me and that's uh, of course 100% okay, but we're seeing that be pretty much commonplace right now is that as soon as the contract's executed, we're ordering the appraisal to see that um, start moving. All right, let's go through these closing delays. All right, this is where the anxiety comes from and the frustration with just another change that's gonna cause problems in our business. But um, I think this new disclosure will actually eliminate a lot of, uh, a lot of problems out there that currently exist with the, the GFE and the HUD that we use. So the CFPB says there are three primary reasons why a new closing disclosure would require a three-day waiting period. They're saying that if the APR is inaccurate or increased by 0.125 or more on a fixed rate loan or 0.25% on an arm, that this would have to take place. This is a current, uh, this is a current requirement. And in fact, uh, there's a three-day requirement that goes around this right now with APR. So if, if a client showed up to closing and their APR was more than 0.125 what they were originally disclosed, then they have the ability to say, I want my lender to redisclose this to me and I can wait three days. Uh, from there, product change from a 30-year fixed to a 15-year fixed, that type of product change would trigger a redisclosure. And of course, many of you know that it's very unreasonable for a buyer to request a, a, a change that significant that late in the process anyway. Uh, but I thought it was really interesting. There was some CFPB um, uh, you know, they won't go out in, uh, in writing and give you any advice or give you any guidance on anything other than the actual rules, uh, but there was a conference call that was had with the CFPB, and, and they mentioned that if somebody switched from a conventional loan to an FHA loan at the last minute, that it would not require a new three-day disclosure as long as the product was still the same product being a 30-year fix. So if you went from a 30-year fixed to a 30-year, uh, on a conventional loan to a 30-year fixed on an FHA loan, they're saying that would not require a redisclosure. So, so just to put that out there for you and, and kind of everybody wrap their arms around that, that's a very significant change in my opinion. And, and, and then there are very few things that would be uh, more significant than that. And they're saying that doesn't require a new disclosure. Now, it would affect APR, and, and of course there are some other side effects to it that, that could cause problems, but, but in reality, I, I don't think it's that big a deal. Uh, the last thing, of course, is there's a prepayment penalty added. Prepayment penalties are basically gone from the business, just like interest only. They were, both of those things were very common uh, back in, from 06 to 2009, but, uh, but prepayment penalties are really gone, so I don't think that's a critical change or anything uh, that somebody needs to worry about. And so this is where I want to get into um, how I think this closing disclosure will actually um, speed up some of the current delays that happen out there. Let's say that um, two days before closing, a buyer was setting up their taxes and insurance in escrow. So they wanted to include the taxes and insurance in their monthly payment. And then two days before closing, they decided, wait, we want to pay those on our own. All right, we want to waive escrows. Well, that triggers a 0.25% fee to be able to do that. And so right now, if that change happened, I would have to redisclose a new fee to the borrower, and then we'd have to wait another full three days. Under the new form, that change can take place, and then that borrower can still close uh, as planned. So does the buyer have to waive the 24-hour delay option in writing? Um, 
there's nothing that says they do, but I can 100% guarantee you as a lender, we would want something in writing. So, so if there is a change like that, then yes, uh, I, would, I would expect you all to see um, some sort of, and, and I think as a realtor, you would want that protection for your client too. I would think you would want them to agree that they had that 24 hour uh, waiting period if they would like. But um, so, so, so to follow up on that question a little bit more, as long as the change is not one of the ones that I have listed, the transaction is only subject to that 24 hours. And, and again, if you do a walk through at 9 a.m. in the morning and, um, and it appears that the wine rack wasn't finished like, you, uh, like your buyer expected, the seller could give them $1,000 and they could still close at noon that day. Uh, going back to the, the, the good question, uh, we would expect some sort of acknowledgement that they're waiving that period of time. But um, so, anyways, to get into that a little bit further, uh, I don't want y'all to be worried about adding things at the last minute. If there's an HOA fee or if there's something else out there, and no, there is no standard letter. It'll it'll probably differ from from uh, lender to lender and, and really transaction to transaction. All right. So let's get into the, the practical application and I think the opportunity that exists out there in the market. How can you be proactive? So, so there's a, a term collaboration and the CFPB has latched on to this and, and you're gonna see collaboration become one of the buzzwords that's attached to this document. So clearly communicating and establishing an email chain from the beginning of a transaction I think is really one of the most critical things you can do and this is something you should start doing now. If you're not starting an email chain that connects the lender, the title company, and both agents on every single uh, important detail of the transaction from the time the contract is executed, um, I think you're missing an opportunity there and I think you're missing an opportunity for things to go really smoothly. Uh, if there's an HOA, if you're selling a condo or representing a buyer on a condo, there is so much information lenders have to get from the HOA associated with the condo that, that creating and, and finding that important point person within the HOA is really important from day one. So, um, and then explaining to clients the need to, the, to expedite the gathering of documentation. Hopefully they've been pre-approved, hopefully they've provided tax returns and, and bank statements and all of these things, but, but as agents, you get to spend more time with a client than anyone, and so you build that tr trust and you build that rapport. And I and I want you all uh, to be able to explain to to these buyers how important it is to respond in a timely manner and and get things for the lender. I know it's frustrating. I know it's an arduous process to go through um, a mortgage loan right now, but but those documents are critical and and they have to be given in a timely manner. And and the more help that we can get, we always appreciate it. Um, so to specifically look at the buyer side for a minute, let's look at buyer agent best practices. So I just kind of put together a list and, and I, I think making sure that, that clients are fully pre-approved and, and really dig past that pre-approval because pre-approval is still a very generic term in the business right now. And, and some people with a, a credit report and, a, and somebody stating what their income uh, might be might be able to get a pre-approval letter, but of course that's not the same as providing pay stubs and W-2s and uh, bank statements and tax returns. That's what a true pre-approval looks like. That means somebody has viewed their documentation and said it matches with what we have to have. Uh, reaching out to that lender. So whether whether it's a lender that you know well that you referred your buyer to, or if it's somebody you don't know, before you write that contract. I would reach out to them and make sure that they're in agreement with the closing date that you're offering because while the buyer might want to close in three weeks, uh, that may not be possible for that lender. Or if they want to close in 45 days because they think it takes that much time, maybe your lender only needs two or three weeks to close the transaction. So, so reach out to that lender before writing that contract and say, hey, what's the soonest you could close? And, and I think that's just a great question and leave it open-ended, let them answer rather than can you close on this date and having them stumble and say, oh, I, th I think I can. Um, let them tell you what date they can guarantee closing because then you have some accountability there. Uh, seven days prior to closing. You can make this business days, you can make this calendar days, but, but I would be reaching out 
to the lender and ask them if they are 100% done with the transaction, appraisal in, title in, survey in, um, the, the clear to close from the underwriter, because that's the point at which everything will have to be done to be able to turn over to get to the title company in time. So if you're done seven days before closing, that's the point at which we hand it over to our attorneys. They draw closing docs for 24, 48 hours. They send them to the title company, and then that three-day period has to take place. So, so I would have a reminder in your phone, whatever it takes, a giant sticky note on the refrigerator, whatever you need to do. But the morning of that third business day prior to closing, Again, reach out, reach out to the lender, reach out to the listing agent, reach out to the title company. Make sure everybody knows that the closing disclosure is going to be given that day, how it's going to be given, how it's going to be acknowledged by the client, and then make sure that everything's going to close smoothly three days later. All right, so getting into the closing disclosure that now is provided separately to the seller. So over the years, we've seen some, some agents uh, some title agents uh, specifically break out a buyer HUD and a seller HUD and then they all come together because the seller doesn't want the buyer to know what they're actually getting from closing and so on and so forth. Now it's nice and easy. There will pretty much be two separate uh, closing disclosures on every single transaction. This isn't a requirement but it is something that will probably become standard practice because it allows for changes to happen on the seller side that don't affect the buyer side and vice versa. So. So you can expect that to happen. And I think it's, it's also important to take a look here at this section and see that now your information will be tied to every transaction. So your broker's name, license ID, and your name and license ID. Uh, I think this is helpful because it does help buyers later on. Uh, if they maybe they have a bad memory and a lot of life changes or it's been 20 years, they pull out this document and they know exactly who helped them take care of everything. Uh, but this creates some accountability too. So every deed of trust, every note that's created has my name and number tied to it as a lender to, so that the government has someone to be accountable for that loan that was given. And now on the realtor side, there's some uh, accountability there both with you guys and the, the title company as well. So just to continue this, this is all gonna be very basic like the HUD. All the numbers change. You can see there's a simple one through 20 section uh, rather than having the 100 section, the 800 section, and so on and so forth. Um, so just to get into the listing agent best practices, and I covered some of this uh, with you, but the initial rollout is going to feel like babysitting. You will have to consistently talk to the buyer, uh, the buyer's agent, and the, the title company and the lender, but don't be afraid to do that. But then most importantly, don't assume that everything is going in place and falling into place like you expect it to if you're not talking to them. Go ahead and confirm it. Don't assume that everything's happened. Uh, nobody's gonna be offended. I'm never offended if somebody calls me and says, hey, is everything on track? Is everything looking good? Is there anything you need from me? It's just a great phone call to get because I know that you care and I know that you're protecting your client when that phone call comes in. Um, contingencies for sale of other property. This is where I, you know, leasebacks uh, have become more and more common over the last few years and I think they'll be continue to become uh, almost a necessity in every transaction where somebody is selling one uh, and buying another. All right, let's see, we've got a quick question. I have been told personal property has to be zero if included in the sale currently, even if there is value. So, so I wouldn't make the blanket statement that personal property has to be zero, and I'm sure you're talking about non-realty uh, addendum and including things like couches and, and those types of things. And, and on that, what we have to do as lenders is if there is a value assigned for something, we actually have to take it out of the sales price of the property. And so you can see when you get into underwriting and uh, somebody's maybe giving them a couch that's worth $450, now you have to pull that out of the sales price and recalculate everything. So I think the general advice has always been if you can state that there is no value for what's being left and that um, that you will need to, um, it's being left at the convenience of the seller, that's really what, what makes it uh, easier for underwriting. So it, it's not a necessity from the standpoint of this is what you have to do, it has to be zero, it, it just makes it a little bit different. So, 
Uh, and yeah, and of course that'll stay the same moving forward. That doesn't change even after August 1st. Um, and then when I talk about leasebacks almost being a necessity, I'm really talking about somebody buying, uh, selling one property and buying another. So unless you know uh, the lender involved in the sale of a house for someone, and then you know the lender involved in the purchase of the new one, making sure that those sync up and those dominoes don't start to fall in the wrong direction, that's what I mean by leasebacks being a necessity. It really um, it has to do with that three-day disclosure, and if, and if not all lenders are meeting that requirement, it, it could be a problem. And, and again, that domino will start to fall. It will just be even more exaggerated with a three-day waiting period, and especially working over weekends and holidays. If somebody didn't disclose prior to uh, Memorial Day, let's say, that would be a problem. So asking my advice on a reasonable lease back time, I think a week, that, that gives everybody enough, um, enough leeway within the transaction because if they miss it by a day, it doesn't cause any problems. If they miss it by two days, it still doesn't cause any problems. And, and that's enough where everybody at that point should be yelling and screaming to, to, for somebody to get their job done. Um, all right, yeah. lastly, knowing who you're working with uh, if you don't have a previous trusting relationship with a mortgage company and title company, this is the time to try and assemble your team. And you don't have to have one specific. You don't have to have five specific. You know anything in there. This isn't. These aren't people that you're going to force your clients to use. But it's people that you can say, look, I just have history with them. They've they've delivered to me on time. Um, and then I think just bringing the personal aspect back to the transaction, stopping by, shaking hands, looking people in the eye, just creates some accountability that, that I think is really important in the transaction. And then communicate and confirm. Like I talked about, don't assume that everything's going smoothly um, when you just don't, you know, making that phone call just takes a minute and it could give you and your buyer a whole lot of peace of mind. So um, thank you all for, for sitting with us today. Let's go through some final questions before we wrap up. And, uh, and then I'll turn it back over to Roxy here in a minute. Uh, sorry, I didn't wear my glasses. Let's see. If uh, commissions change, will we have to redisclose? What if we don't get the agent's license info for page five? You know, that's part of the critical nature of, of this document. So if, if there is uh, a change, I've focused more on the buyer side today. I haven't done as much research on the seller side of the transaction, and so if the commission changes, uh, I feel that could be a problem, and I'm guessing that the seller would have a, a, a right to wait, uh, to, to wait 24 hours to be able to approve a change like that. So again, don't, I'm not gonna go on record with that, but, um, but I think that is a reasonable uh, expectation that if something big like that changed, that it could cause a problem. Um, and and again, the as far as licensing uh, and getting that information for page five, uh, yeah, we would have a problem, and we would not be able to proceed if we were not able to get the, the agent's license uh, information. So so having a standard email that has your broker's information and your information in it to send out at the beginning of the transaction, I think that's part of your responsibility. And I think that's something that you can do proactively that just helps everybody along the way. All right, let's see. Uh, yeah, uh, agreed that, that anybody who's in the dark on these changes, it, it could be quite shocking to them come August 1st, but, but getting out, getting ahead of this, Helping transactions move smoothly for your buyer, uh, that's a talking point that people will use at parties and, and they will complain about something, uh, a transaction being delayed and we really like to buy this house but we gotta wait another week now uh, and, and that's where hopefully your client can counter and say, wow, everything went really smoothly. I didn't even know all of that took place. I didn't even know all these big changes uh, happened because my agent, my lender, they were proactive and they jumped out in front of this thing and they took care of me, because that's what this is really all about. So, uh, if there aren't any other questions, I'll, I'll give it a few seconds here, and then, uh, like I said, Roxy will, will wrap it up for us. All right, Roxy, take it away.